This is Mo from Smart Training 365. In today's video, I'll be talking about dynamic versus static muscle contraction, and if it's worth including isometric exercises in your workout routine if your goal is hypertrophy. I will be also talking about full range of motion and what it really means, as it's easy to compare full range of motion with zero range of motion, but it's not easy to establish an absolute rule about how much range of motion is ideal. So let's get started. Dynamic muscle contraction occurs when a muscle lengthens and shortens against resistance. This type of muscle contraction causes the joint over which that muscle crosses to flex or extend, thereby producing anatomical movement. Static muscle contraction, aka isometric muscle contraction, occurs when a muscle holds tension without lengthening or shortening instead of causing the joint to flex or extend the muscle holds that anatomical position without movement. Generally speaking, dynamic muscle contraction is considered more productive for the purpose of muscle growth and physique development as compared with static muscle contraction. It's also believed to be more functional from a strength building standpoint. Dynamic muscle contraction requires a range of motion, though not necessarily full range of motion. However, for muscle building purposes, a longer range of motion is more productive than a very short range of motion, generally speaking. A study published in the Journal of Strength and Condition and Research concluded that increases of muscular size and also a muscular strength was greatest in a test group that used the longest range of motion. The exercise tested was the squat. This was true even though the group using the shorter range of motion used 10% to 25% more weight than the group using the longer range of motion. In the early 1920s, a man called himself Charles Atlas, real name Angelo Siciliano, began promoting an exercise program called Dynamic Tension, which based entirely on isometric exercise. The irony here is that he called his course dynamic, but in actuality, it was the opposite of dynamic exercise. In the course that he marketed, a person would perform a series of exercises, all without weights and without movement. The exercises were all static holds, whereby a person would simply hold a tensed position, pressing or pulling against immovable objects, example the wall or floor, or their own opposing force. This advertisement became ironic. A cartoon showing a scrawny man on the beach bullied by a larger, more muscular man, embarrassing him in front of his girlfriend. The scrawny man then buys the dynamic tension course and after a short while, in only 15 minutes a day, he miraculously transforms himself into a muscular he-man. He returns to the beach and punches the bully in the face, thereby winning the admiration of his girlfriend. In his advertisement, Charles Atlas publicly claimed that he had developed his physique using his very same static tension exercise course. He became the poster boy for isometrics of that era. However, that was not entirely true. He actually developed his physique by performing traditional meaning dynamic weightlifting exercises with movement. In the 1980s edition of a magazine called Ditherman, it was reported that Atlas performed a one-arm overhead press with 236 pound weight. Separate 1920 edition stated that he did a one-arm press with 266 pound weight. He clearly trained and developed his physique using weights dynamically. Of course, he realized the marketing appeal of selling a course that anyone could do without any equipment in the comfort and privacy of their own home. The exercises were easy to understand and easy to do, as compared with more intimidating and complicated weightlifting exercises. Apparently, by the year of 1940, he had sold over 400,000 courses at $30 each. If those figures are correct, Charles Atlas and his business partner made over 12 million, which would have been a staggering amount of money in those days. Obviously, very few people knew back then that Charles Atlas had actually not developed his physique using only the program he was selling. Today, this might be considered false advertising. There was no way of researching such things back then. 
But even today, there are many products that are marketed as miraculous, even though they could not possibly produce the results the manufacturers claim. Charles Atlas was a dedicated fitness practitioner and exercised diligently his entire life. Even at 75 years old, he was known to do a daily morning routine, which included 15 knee bands, 100 sit-ups, and 300 push-ups. These are all dynamic movements. He was also a devoted husband and father. However, he was a business person and he realized that many people wanted to be strong and muscular and were willing to pay a price for that. And he took advantage of that fact. If we were told today that the exercises that Atlas recommended would develop a muscular physique, we might not believe it. We might suspect that we are being fed propaganda. But are we any wiser today? Are we less likely to believe a too good to be true notion about getting fit? without skepticism? It appears not. In fact, the same deceptive marketing of fitness programs and methods occurs today on an even larger scale. Isometric exercise is most often used in physical therapy programs as a way of introducing resistance exercise to specific muscles while avoiding the movement of a joint which may be injured or being rehabilitated. Here is an example of a static pectoral muscle contraction. The pectoral muscle is contracted without the shoulder joint movement that is typically during standard dynamic pectoral exercises. The hands are simply pressed against each other, thereby causing the pectorals to experience static muscle tension. There is no range of motion nor any reps with isometric exercise. Instead, muscle tension is typically held for a count of 20 or 30 seconds. When pushing against one's own opposing force, or against an immovable object, there is no way of establishing how much force is being used because there is no weight being lifted. In such cases, there is no particular force threshold that needs to be met. One simply uses his own judgment as to the degree of force applied. Here we see a man performing an isometric anterior deltoid exercise. He is pressing his fist of his left arm forward against the wall, thereby creating static muscle contraction of his anterior deltoid. On the right, the man is performing an isometric posterior deltoid exercise. He is pressing his elbow of his right arm posteriorly against the wall, thereby creating static muscle contraction of his posterior deltoid. These are exercises typically used in shoulder rehabilitation without joint movement. Isometric exercise can also be done with free weights. One could hold a pair of 10 pound dumbbells to the sides with arms straight for a time count, 30 seconds for example. Or one could hold a barbell with elbow bent at 90 degree at the midpoint of the barbell curl for a predetermined time count. Using weight establishes the threshold a force to be met, which allows one to gauge between how much force is being used and whether strength is improving. When rehabilitating an injury, dynamic muscle contraction exercises with joint movement may not be feasible. Often an injury limits joint mobility. The concept of challenging a muscle without causing the joint to move has merit in those circumstances. Resistance exercise often involves a combination of dynamic contraction for a target muscle, while stabilizing muscles work isometrically to maintain posture. For example, here I'm performing a standing barbell curl. My biceps are performing dynamic muscle contraction, lengthening and shortening, elongating and contracting. However, other muscles are stabilizing my upright position isometrically. My lower back, meaning erector spinae, is holding static tension to prevent me from being pulled forward by the front-loaded torso. My trapezius is loaded by the opposite position loading downward resistance of the free weights. My glutes and hamstrings are also maintaining isometric tension in helping to maintain rigid posture against the forward-pulling barbell. My forearm flexor muscles are keeping my hands in line with my forearms, even though the barbell is trying to bend my wrists back. My fingers are maintaining a static tension grip on the barbell, and the muscles of my calves and my feet are also in some degree of static activation. The stabilizing muscles are participating isometrically, but they are not getting the kind of stimulation that is necessary for growth, nor for strength gains through the entire range of motion. This is why full range of motion is encouraged when pursuing muscular gains. Ideally speaking, all exercises should be like the standing barbell curl. 
With exercises like that, the intended target muscle, the biceps in this case, is the muscle that is working dynamically while all the stabilizing muscles are merely working isometrically. However, people often mistakenly cause the target muscle to work isometrically while the non-target muscles are working dynamically. When this happens, the target muscle gets less productive stimulation than the non-targeted muscles. Here's an irony for you. The standing barbell curls is considered a biceps exercise, not a lower back exercise, right? This is because the stabilizing isometric contraction that is provided by the lower back is not good enough to qualify as a lower back exercise. However, when we do leg raises, like the one I'm showing here, we consider it an abdominal exercise even though the abs are mostly stabilizing the spine during the exercise. The abs do not lift the legs because the abs are not even connected to the legs. The hip flexors are lifting the legs, so when we do leg raises, the hip flexors are doing the dynamic work, even though they are not the targeted muscle, and the abs are doing the isometric work, mostly providing spinal support, yet we call this an ab exercise. Here we see the abs. This muscle originates on the pubic bone of the pelvis. It then reaches up and attaches into the front part of the lower ribs. It does not attach to the legs at all. In fact, do you see any leg bones in these illustrations? Of course not. The abs simply cannot pull on the legs. Now compare that with the leg raise movement being performed. It should be obvious that the abs cannot produce that motion. If the fitness industry wants to call leg raises an ab exercise, then barbell curls should be called a lower back exercise. Otherwise, leg raises should be called a hip flexor exercise. The name of the exercise should be based on the muscle that is doing the most work, the muscle that is working dynamically. It is ridiculous to name an exercise based on the muscle which only works isometrically to stabilize the posture while another muscle does the majority of work. Any type of leg raise, whether it's performed while lying flat on the floor or while hanging from a chin bar or while suspended on a Roman chair, is an extremely inefficient abdominal exercise. This is because the abs are not working dynamically. Some would argue that leg raise is considered an ab exercise because the pubic bone should be pulled forward toward the rib cage as the legs are raised. This would theoretically cause the abs to shorten and contract to a small degree. However, as I explained in the 16 biomechanical factor video, it is extremely difficult for the abs to function properly during a leg raise. This is because the hip flexors are trying to arch the spine while the abs are trying to flex the spine. The result is that abs are not able to fully contract because the hip flexors are preventing spinal flexion. The exercise here called the lower back extension is another example of a person bending the wrong joint for the intended target muscle. The exercise is typically intended for the erector spinae. However, the erector spinae extends the spine. It does not extend the hips. Yet, it is the hip joint that is primarily being moved in this exercise. The torso is typically held in the same position through the exercise. Thus, the erector spinae are working mostly isometrically to maintain that torso position. Meanwhile, the glutes, with some help of the adductors and hamstring, are extending the hip joint dynamically. Therefore, the intended target muscle of the exercise, which is the erector spinae, is getting less stimulation than are the non-targeted muscle, which are the glutes, adductor, and hamstring. Again, this demonstrates how we sometimes mistakenly use dynamic superior muscle contraction for muscle that is not our target muscle, while using inferior muscle contraction for the muscle we most want to prioritize. An example of how to work the erector spine efficiently is the seated torso extension. First, the spine is forward rounded, meaning flexed, which elongates the erector spine. Then the spine is arched which contracts the erector spinae. Notice that I am staying entirely on the left side of the apex. I am not crossing over to the right side. Thus, I'm keeping the same muscle loaded the entire time. When considering dynamic versus isometric as part of your exercise analysis, the questions to ask are as follow. Which muscle am I intending to target with this exercise? Which joint is moved by the muscle I am intending to target? 
is the joint which is operated by the muscle I'm intending to target, the one that bends most during that exercise? If the joint that is crossed by our target muscle is not the joint that moves most during a given exercise, then you are activating a non-target muscle more than your target muscle. The target muscle should be producing the actual movement. It should not merely be holding its joint steady while another non-target muscle does most of the actual work at a different joint. Dynamic muscle contraction is good. Static muscle contraction is less good. Static muscle tension is better than no muscle contraction at all, but it's not nearly as beneficial as dynamic muscle contraction for muscular development and for improving functional strength through a full range of motion. There are only two exceptions to this rule. A joint injury or other physical anomaly is preventing or inhibiting normal freedom of movement. A person's goal is to maximize the strength of a muscle in one specific position. For example, an arm wrestler who wants to get stronger at a specific angle, isometric muscle tension may be preferable over dynamic muscle contraction in some exercise specific movement. But for the purpose of general fitness and muscular development, dynamic exercise is preferable over isometric exercise. Up to this point, our discussion has been comparing movement that are dynamic with no movement that are isometric exercises. The next question is, how much movement is ideal or sufficient? It's easy to compare full range of motion with zero range of motion. It's not so easy to establish an absolute rule about how much range of motion is ideal. We all seen people in the gym carelessly doing exercises with very abbreviated range of motion. It's logical to assume that insufficient range of motion will compromise the benefit of the exercise. After all, a range of motion of 10% is almost isometric. But is 100% range of motion absolutely necessary or even best? Is 100% range of motion always safe? Is 80% range of motion as effective as 100% range of motion? At what point does a reduced range of motion become insufficient? A muscle's full range of motion could theoretically be defined as being from the point at which the muscle is most elongated to the point at which it is most shortened. However, it's clear to those of us who have been participating in the sport for decades that using 100% full range of motion is not necessary for optimal muscle development and often has potential risk. So 100% may not be necessary, but how much is enough? The answer depends on a number of variables which include the following. The resistance curve of a particular exercise, whether a muscle or a joint experience mechanical disadvantage during the early part of its range of motion, the amount of weight being used in a given exercise, the skeletal limitation of the joint being operated, whether or not a muscle has been warmed up. In the 16 biomechanical factor video, I talked about the mechanical disadvantage that occurs when the biceps is pulling on the forearm from a parallel angle, when the elbow is straight. As such, it would be risky to perform 100% full range of motion on a preacher barbell curl while using a weight that represents anything more than about 70% of the biceps maximum effort. This is because the combination of the mechanical disadvantage with the resistance curve that provides too much resistance at the beginning of the movement and using significant amount of weight could easily jeopardize the safety of the biceps tendon. However, it would not be risky to perform 100% full range of motion when performing a standing barbell curl with that same weight because when the forearm is parallel to gravity, there is no load on the biceps. So the mechanical disadvantage that occurs during standing barbell curls will not oppose any injury risk. A person could use a weight that requires maximum effort with full range of motion without much risk at all when doing a standing barbell curls. It would not be risky to perform a full extension on a preacher barbell curl if the weight being used is approximately less than 30% of maximum effort. So you can see how the factors combine to determine when full range of motion is safe and when it's not. Determining enough or too much range of motion is also subject to other factors, including momentum, repetition, speed, and whether there is an apex or a base at the beginning or at the end of the range of motion. 
all these factors combine and determine what the appropriate range of motion might be for a particular exercise under those specific circumstances. Each exercise has a different set of mechanical circumstances, so each exercise would require its own parameters in terms of range of motion that would be considered ideal. Nevertheless, basic range of motion guidelines can and should be established in this video since we're talking about dynamic muscle contraction, and that automatically implies range of motion. We know that skeletal muscles have more strength potential when they are elongated versus when they are shortened or contracted. Therefore, it is reasonable to assume that the early part of the range of motion is more productive than the later part of the range of motion. So as a rule, we could say that if one is going to abbreviate part of the range of motion of an exercise, it's better to abbreviate the later part of the range of motion rather than the early part. We know that there can be some degree of increased injury risk at the maximum stretch position of a muscle, especially if the weight being used is very heavy, allowing fewer than six repetitions generally. This would be further magnified if there is a mechanical disadvantage occurring at that point. So as a rule, we could say that caution should be used during the most elongated 10 to 20 percent of a range of motion of an exercise that loads heavily in the early phase especially if the weight being used is heavy and there is a mechanical disadvantage occurring the final 10 percent of a muscle's range of motion seems to be the least productive from the perspective of hypertrophy a muscle generally has the least strength potential in the final phase. In fact, it's often difficult to even the later part of the range of motion when using a weight that sufficiently challenges the early phase of the repetition. Also, there does seem to be a bit more risk, especially in the joints that extend like the elbow when doing tricep extension or the knees when doing leg extension and the final degrees of full extension. So be careful upon full extension or abbreviate that final part by about 10%. This leaves the middle 80% of the range of motion which seems to be always safe and always productive. During the first few repetitions of a set, when the muscle is least fatigued, it's good to use as much range as possible, assuming it's within one's comfort range, no pain or discomfort. However, as the muscle becomes more and more fatigued and less capable of doing full range of motion, it is acceptable to lessen the range of motion to whatever is necessary, even if it's only 50% movement. But this should be determined only by necessity, not by laziness or carelessness. It should be determined by a greatly diminished physical ability, not by lack of willingness. Reduce the range of motion only when you must and if the only other alternative is to stop completely. Never use so much range of motion that it distorts a joint to a painful degree or takes the limb significantly beyond normal ranges or contorts the body into extremely unnatural positions. Extreme stretch as part of the weighted range of motion of an exercise has never been associated with greatly enhanced muscle growth. In the extreme stretch position, there is a reduced potential benefit and also a drastically increased risk of injury. I hope you find value in this video. Learning biomechanics and the 16 biomechanical factors we teach will allow you to work out efficiently and reach your goal without wasting time and energy. For workout programs or to get certified, check out my website smarttraining365.com. If you have any question, email me at mo at smarttraining365.com. Thanks for watching. Take care.